so the fuel source, this wedge, this single wedge, yep. how much did this weigh? Uh, 223 grams. So I've run the numbers, and uh, when um, muscovium was first synthesized, and we know it's, uh, it's, not, it's not stable, but when it was first synthesized, um, it cost, uh, according to what I, information I found on the internet, it cost about a million dollars US to produce four atoms. And that wedge requires in the order of 10 to the 23 atoms. So if you if you work backwards, uh, it ends up being that the cost of that wedge, uh, of that wedge, if you were to somehow able to manufacture it today, would cost around 3.3 billion times the current US national debt of 34 trillion US dollars. So it's bottom line is that fabricating uh, something like that, even if we had the technology and we're able to do it, it's just totally not economically viable. Unless you can find a natural source of that stuff, um, you can forget about it. It'd send, it'd send the world broke. Yeah. Yeah, so manufacturing is right out. We would have to get it from a meteor that came, an interstellar yeah. meteor yeah. that came from the right yeah. solar system or yeah. Uh, yeah, so, asteroid mining, but it would have to be an, an you know, interstellar asteroid. Yeah, well, that's right. So, um, look, you might be able to um, some somewhat alleviate the, uh, the financial stress if you had technology like fusion technology and, you know, just let it run, um, you know, powering the, the production process because it produces more energy than, you know, than, than you need to put in. But um, even so, um, as I said, from what, from what information I could find, it cost about a million US dollars to manufacture four atoms of the stuff. Um, and uh, even then it was unstable. So, yeah, it's just just not possible. And that, that ties it. Ties in actually with what um, Lazar has stated on on um, numerous occasions uh, that look it's, it'd just be too expensive to to produce, assuming you could produce it. Now, isn't this what we call uh, unobtainium? Yeah, unpentium. Is that what you mean? Oh, sorry, no. 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 Okay. No. You're, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in engineering cool. terms, we, we like, you know, this is like uh, it's an impossible barrier to entry to anyone that, you know, doesn't have access yeah. to asteroid mining or incredibly, you know, huge state yeah. sponsored, you know, refining and manufacturing facilities. Yeah. It's, Look, it's just, I, I only did the exercise just because I was curious. That's all. So I just, yeah, I ran the numbers and worked out the cost and, it was just uh, you know, astronomical. I mean, imagine that, 3.3 billion times the current U.S. national debt to produce 223 grams of it. Now, let's compare that with the demon. The demon core, it weighed 6.2 kilograms, about 14 pounds, and it cost... Well, I mean, if you, if you use the Manhattan, the Manhattan Project as a... As a benchmark, well, that that costs two billion. So, you know, essentially that that material, you know, for its end of day use, cost two billion US dollars back in the forties. Yeah. So. Two yeah. billion. Yeah. So there you go, and that was in the forties. Well, it certainly helps when you've uh, got access to the right machinery, doesn't it? Oh yeah, oh definitely. So uh, let's see, what did we want to talk about today? I guess. Okay, so, so can I can I just um, 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 define first of all? Yeah, that yeah, that, sorry, yeah, that's right, um, Jeremy. Sort of yeah, try and put up the um, the uh, the uh, diagram I've got there, the island of stability diagram, and just hold it there for a minute, if you can. What's that? This thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, so just scroll down a little bit more. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. So, look. First of all, I just wanted to to, to mention uh, the, the objective here, and 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 the objective here is to is to go through um, my project Gravitor synopsis, 
um, which we can call up later on. Uh, but we just want to try and and go through um, the science, the minimum scientific requirements that the Project Gravitor team are going to need to satisfy. Uh, and I wanted to do this before um, they release uh, their documentary video, so that so that we can compare what they release to what the science says they should have released. And that way, it gives us at least some kind of metric for veracity and truth. If we do it post facto, then uh, you know we can be accused of bias or, or whatever. But if we do it before the fact uh, and compare the before and after, it gives us a much cleaner uh, comparison. Um, Jeremy, if you can just go back to the, to the diagram there, I just want to uh, mention something about it. Um, I'll state the obvious, but I just want to mention it. So that diagram there, um, um, you can see that diagram is just, it's standard science that's decades old right that's decades old and the way that you get um the the island of stability and the number of uh, uh and, and the stable isotope is you do what i've basically done there i've written the instructions you grab that diagram um and you can get that there's a link there that i that i show where you can get that from you grab the diagram just draw a circle around the island of stability and you can literally read off at 115 protons you can read off the number of neutrons that theoretically should be sitting on the beach of your island of stability. And that's where the, the standard uh, 299 uh, isotope prediction comes from. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Jeremy, if you can perhaps call up uh, the Project Gravitor synopsis that, that I've got, I sent you the, the PDF um i don't know whether you still have that so i think one thing one thing that bob lazar mentioned is that the um the element uh 115 could emit positrons or something along those lines but the further we go towards the neutron rich side uh the more likely we're going to get alpha decay instead of beta positive decay mm. right so look, look, yeah look to be honest uh i i don't really know um i haven't approached it from from that perspective um I've, I've only focused on what i'm actually able to yeah that's it what i'm actually able to 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 investigate and verify for myself so if you don't if you don't draw a boundary uh, around where you're about what your interest is you can you can get sucked off in all different directions you know with all the mysteries and and this and that so uh yeah I've confined myself pretty precisely to, to determining the number of neutrons. So, Jeremy, if you can just scroll up a little bit, let me just explain. Uh, go to the first slide. Okay. So, so I've put together a, a synopsis, um, a, a summary, basically, of the minimum scientific requirements that the Project Gravitor team are going to have to satisfy um, in order for, for, for their version of events to be consistent, not only with the science, but with the work done by others, like uh, in particular, Emeritus Professor Paul Edwin Potter. So Paul Edwin Potter um, wrote a, a book called uh, The Gravitational Manipulation of Domed Craft. You can get that, you can buy the book if you want to, or you can get uh, um, an online version um, for free, basically a PDF. And in that, in that book, and it's, I don't know how many hundreds of pages long, there's about 45 pages that relate, that's the book, there's about 45 pages in there that relates to the story of Bob Lazar. So um, what I've done is I've pulled everything together, plus the science that I've done, and put it together in, in um, um, that Project Gravitor synopsis uh, presentation. So I cover, um, if, you can, if I can get you to go back to that, that first slide of mine there. I cover um, episode uh, 65, 67, and 68. Now, episode 65 um, is, is basically um, uh, an episode that I put together uh, imagining that um, I was delivering a reverse engineering progress, progress report uh, to my leadership at S4. So I imagined that I had... Bob Lazar on my team. I imagine that that Barry Castillo was on the team, um, Paul Edwin Potter was on the team, and myself were on the team. And we were delivering a reverse engineering progress report to whoever it was that um, 
that uh, that Bob was working for at, at S4. I think it was Dennis. Dennis. And these, these episode numbers that you, you're talking about right here, yeah. these are these are on the Quinta Essentia part. Yeah, five correct. Yeah. Channel. Yeah, and if if you want only those and exactly those, I've got a playlist called Project Gravitor. So you can go to the Project Gravitor playlist, and it'll be those episodes and those episodes only. Yeah, that's it. So, um, so basically, in in that first episode sixty five, I cover off the uh, fuel wedge manufacturing process. So, if I can get you just to move to the next slide. So, so yeah, stop it. So, this is the manufacturing process uh, as uh, as was described by uh, uh, Ken Wright um, and Emeritus Professor uh, Paul. Edwin Potter. What I did was I added my science to that process. And the steps are very clearly outlined there uh, about what needs to happen. So according to Professor Potter, um, the research that he did, uh, um, covering off uh, all of the statements made by, by Bob Lazar, was that um, some disks, those element 115 disks, uh, which were held at S4, were sent to uh, Los, Al Los Alamos National Laboratory to be actually uh, turned into and manufactured into uh, a fuel wedge, right? So that's the process uh, that Paul Edwin Potter uh, describes. And he also describes that a minimum of 12 discs were required to be, uh, to be uh, compressed together, cold welding, for example, um, and then machined eventually into a wedge. And the, the effect uh, uh, became uh, more pronounced as you added uh, more, more discs, but 12 was the, the minimum number of discs required. My calculations show that the thickness of each disc, in order to do that, the thickness of each disc is uh, one quarter wavelength. So it's, it's around um, 6.8 six something millimeters something like this six and two thirds millimeters something like this it's all it's all it's all in there so that first slide covers the actual manufacturing process and if you if you listen to the to the to the audio you can see how I, I cover every 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 step in the process the the additional um out of one cone you'll get eight wedges right now that's something that I've actually calculated based upon statements made by Bob Lazar in the Corbell documentary uh, Bob makes statements that that there are all these slices uh, uh, that get made into the cone, and he didn't understand. Well, I actually uh, um, analysed that and found that you can you can get a total of eight wedges from uh, one cone, and that's what those dashed lines represent. And in that slide there, you yeah, just don't move off. In that slide there, um, you can see the different slicing ang uh, angles associated with each. Uh, set of disc configurations, so 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 discs, uh, depending on how many discs are supplied to LANL, uh, will determine what your slicing angles are, et cetera, so on and so forth. And that's the calculation for it. It's really straightforward. There is, there is nothing extraterrestrial about that whatsoever. That is a terrestrially solved problem. I can tell you that as a professional engineer. Right, that doesn't need space aliens. That's You, you could give that uh, as uh, to a... Uh, to a first year engineering student as an uh, as an assignment mm -hmm. with the objective go away get me as much product as you can out of this satisfying these conditions with minimal uh minimal waste so, so yeah they, they they'd chop off all this they leave a cone and then they'd recycle all that other metal and re yeah, correct. Into discs yeah so when you when you do that when you when you do batch batch runs of five cones you produce zero waste so as long well, as you what does this achieve when when they put the they stack all these layers up, what is that? A, is like okay, a so so theory? so what it does is the so called anti gravitational effect of element one fifteen is magnified or amplified naturally to the point where um, you're able to to actually then uh, grab onto it and amplify it further. So if you use less than twelve discs. The effect apparently is still there, but it's not enough to easily be able to to grab that that let's call it anti gravitational signal 
and amplify it. So that's why you need a minimum of 12 discs, according to what um, uh, you know, Potter and, and, and Co say. So on this slide here, we have some really important information. So here we have uh, the diameter of the waveguide and the uh, the uh, the radius or the diameter of the of the reactor housing. Now, um, as it turns out, according to my calculations, both of those are exact multiples of the fundamental wavelength, right? Of the fundamental element one fifteen atom anti gravitational wavelength, and the the anti gravitational wavelength are there. I think I think I've written it down there. It's like twenty six point or 26 and two thirds millimeters, something like this. So everything, so bottom line is everything. This is a, this is a percentage. Um, I don't see the mil, a millimeter. I think if you scroll up a little bit, you might see in the top right hand corner. Oh no, it'll, it'll be on a later slide then. I'll put it somewhere else. So so if you, if you scroll down, for example, to that last, yeah, here we go, stop there, stop there. If you scroll down on there, see, we go. So on there, you'll see that um, in the gravity A wave box down the bottom, um, uh, what S4 will, will do is they will um, produce um, an artifact that sits in between those two limits. I've called it the, the, the potter limit and the story limit, right? And it all lines up. So um, if you uh, so you can see that that the the wavelength, the the gravity A wave fundamental wavelength is somewhere between twenty six and two third millimeters, and twenty six point three two millimeters. Right. So that's the signal. So somewhere in there, somewhere in that in that band, is uh, the, uh, the 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 frequency and the characteristics that actually get. Get amplified, so it's somewhere between eleven point two four gigahertz and eleven point three three nine gigahertz. So that's the signal that actually gets amplified. The element one fifteen signal that actually gets amp amplified. And the entire um, waveguide and reactor assembly is all scaled. Everything's scaled to those numbers, to somewhere in there. So in in Potter's um, original publication, the diameter of uh, that reactor dome is 280 millimetres. In his original publication, the diameter of the waveguide is 80 millimetres, right? Um, what I've done in that diagram that you saw before on like the second slide or something, um, you actually, yeah, see there, what I've done is I've expressed those dimensions in terms of the fundamental uh, gravity A wave wavelength. Right. So all you need to know. So once once you've got bottom line is once you've got that wavelength, I've called it R, you know, everything you've got everything. Right. So this is what uh, one of the things that we need to check uh, with the project Gravitor team when the when the, uh, the documentary gets released. We need to check the dimensions of their waveguide. We need to check the dimensions of their reactor. If if they don't line up. Uh, then somebody's made a mistake, All right? So, um, and here you can see the the, the gravity B wave uh, seven point four six or seven point four three there. Um, so there's everything on that on that slide. There's everything essential that uh, you need to know if you are going to reverse engineer uh, the so-called yeah, sports thing. But right. you got to get this unobtainable element 115 yeah. stuff first, which costs a right. trillion dollars a gram. Uh, so, yeah. So, so um, look, obviously, so obviously, all of what I've done is based on the assumption that a stable form of the ice tape actually exists. So, I have a couple questions about yeah. this too. So, this is an yeah. interesting number. So, you have this gigahertz number, and then you have a hertz. Yeah. That this is. Yeah, this is radio frequency, right? Or a little higher. Microwave, than radio. yeah. And microwave. this is, yeah. My, yeah, so this is microwave frequency, and this is like ELF. That's extremely low frequency. Yeah. Correct. In fact, yeah. I plugged the 746 uh, hertz into, you know, Wolfram Alpha, and it says that, yeah. you know, if we take lambda equals C over V um, for the speed of light uh, with that frequency, it gives us a, a distance of uh, 2,000. Uh, yeah, twenty four thousand nine hundred and seventy miles. Yeah, 
which is uh, approximately the the, uh, the radius of the of the Earth at the at the equator. Interesting. Um, um, in fact, it's just sixty nine off. It's six. It, it's like sixty nine off, sixty nine miles off from. Yeah, well, that's a huge amount. Sixty nine. Number one, that's a huge amount, right? That is huge. Sixty nine miles is not trivial. Number one. Number yeah, two, but yeah, if I add sixty nine miles to the equator, it, it puts me about uh, three miles up into the ionosphere. So, well, that gets to, that gets talking like that's towards the Schumann resonance and stuff. But I think it may just be a coincidence. Well, actually, it, it might be it might be helpful to any anti gravity device if the Schumann resonance does match the gravitational thing. But it's not necessarily the case. See what I sort of want people to understand is that what does that 7.46 hertz mean okay it's a good good question so i'm glad you asked it the answer to that is you need to look at the the fourier distribution the fourier series that that generates that value you need to view it not as electromagnetic waves no 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 that's not how you need to view it you need to view uh, each one of the 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 harmonics in that fourier spectrum as the probability amplitude of gravitons being absorbed and emitted into and from the quantum vacuum. So it's, it's, it's a probabilistic uh, um, um, phenomenon. It is not electromagnetic radiation, right? So to draw the comparison between electromagnetic radiation and that value, it's drawing the wrong comparison. So uh, I just wanted to sort of really be clear about that, right? So, so in, in, a, in a Fourier series, you have two spectra occurring. You've got an amplitude spectrum and you've got a frequency spectrum. The amplitude spectrum needs to be interpreted as the probability amplitude spectrum of particles either being absorbed or, or emitted by the quantum vacuum and because it's it's occurring at the at the surface of the earth the quantum vacuum is polarized so at the first harmonic um, um, at the surface of the earth for example 64 percent of all um, um, gravitons being absorbed or virtual particles being emitted by the the polarized form of the um, quantum vacuum 64% of them will, will have the fundamental frequency value associated with them. Right? So we need to look we need to look at this in terms of quantum mechanics and probabilities, not in terms of electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, we're, Jeremy, we're talking about the vacuum here. So the 7.46 hertz is kind of like the half-life of like if you swept all the virtual particles out of a region near the earth that's that's how fast they would come back sort of yeah or? that's right yeah yeah that's right that's it, i mean it, it it's it's a measure of um when they do pop back into existence yes it can be a measure of how quickly they they return absolutely but it's also um um a measure of uh the 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 actual wave function frequency that the particles will have when they instantaneously pop back into existence and then collapse right yeah so so what we have is is a situation uh that is really purely quantum mechanical driven and is it sits outside of electromagnetics and um gr it's a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon cool yeah. um so I mean, yeah, the numbers add up. I, I think you should also talk about some of. I mean, are, are you are you? I guess uh, Jeremy asked a question, but uh, we should get back on the. You you had some things to say first, and then we should. Yeah, sure. So if we could just kind of move move through that that um the the rest of that presentation. So if you can get, just go to where you were last time, Jeremy, that'd be good. Okay. Yeah. So if you could. So 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 on that slide, there's a summary which which we've kind of covered off. Um, there's my prediction for the stable isotope, which is 296. That's just my guess. You know, uh, anything could 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 happen. Um, now, on that next slide there, addendum, uh, what I want to point out is that I show, and you can see that in the form of the equations, that there is no difference between gravity A and gravity B. On this, I absolutely, totally, 
110% disagree with Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar uh, mentions uh, that there are two forms of gravity, gravity A and gravity B. I just, I think that's just dead flat wrong. I don't think he was lying. I just think he didn't know, right? What I demonstrate is that the the, the same equation can be used to generate, to generate a uh, gravity A results and gravity B results. So there's only one form of gravity, right? Um, and that equation that I've got there in that in that story solution, that particle, which comes from particle physics, those equations there are, are, are all, uh, they come from 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 the same source. Um, and what's Where remarkable... Where 4, 15 over 2 come from? Okay, so that's, that's because if you... Okay, if you draw a square wave, right? So that's how um, everything starts off in my solution. So if you draw a square wave, um, and you you build a square wave, and exactly using Fourier, Fourier. series, yeah. um, what you end up with, or so what you start with is the frequency. Let's imagine, for example, that you set the, that that overall frequency to I don't know, ten to the 23, 20, 10 to the twenty five years, or something like this, right? What we're interested in is not the square wave uh, as it exists. What we're interested in is the fully rectified square wave because gravity is a constant function, right? So we need to apply a fully rectified square wave to achieve a constant function. When you do that, when you fully rectify, what you're, what you're basically doing is doubling the frequency. So to compensate for that, you need to halve the frequency. So that's where the half comes from. So this now, is the this is the term in front of the Fourier series. Wait, yeah, is this, correct. So is this the the four fifteen over two? Is that the dominant term in the Fourier? Is that the one with the maximum amplitude, or is that just no, no? So so I've just explained where the half comes from. So the second question is where does where does the four fifteen come from? And the answer to that uh, I cover off in my uh, Lazar paper. And the answer to that is that. Uh, once you hit 415, the principle of diminishing return starts to starts to apply. So if you start moving beyond, so at 415, what you've replicated is 90, is greater than 99.9% .9 of the value of G, right? So if you start moving beyond that, if you want to start doing 99.99 or 99.999, then your power ampl amplification factor starts to substantially skyrocket. And you can people can calculate that for themselves in the spreadsheet calculator that I that I provide on ResearchGate it's called the EGM spreadsheet calculator. So people can play around with that, and you can see the the massive rise in power amplification factor for for every you know, fractional uh, um, decrease in uh, gravitational acceleration. So so that value of four fifteen is actually ends up becoming the optimal solution so that's why it's 415 and not, and not like a thousand and fifteen for example so uh, in terms of I mean could could you so so basically if I understand correctly you've got a model where you uh, at each point in space there's this Fourier transform which describes all of the frequencies that are available there is that is that correct? Uh, yes, with the exception of, I would not use the word transform because nothing's been transformed, okay? It's it's a functional description of exactly what you said. So, no, there are no Fourier transforms which are occurring. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a functional decomposition of gravitational acceleration at the point, just like you talked about. Well, a gravitational, is it it's just the, the vacuum modes that are there or is that... Well, what do you mean gravitational acceleration? Okay, so so let's take the value of G at the surface of the Earth, 9.81, okay? Now, that is a single value, right? 9.81. However, with with a Fourier series, with with uh, the Fourier analysis uh, that, that I've provided, that number, 9.81, can be broken down into a spectrum of gravitational accelerations, and when you add them together, you end up with 9.81, right? So each, so just imagine that that, that value 9.81. Imagine it's an harmonic, uh, and you keep adding the harmonics together until you end up with the value 9.81. 
So there's, there's no transformation that occurs. It's a functional decomposition. I mean, I, I don't see how the set of sines and cosines are things. Well, I guess in this case, sines or cosines. But I don't see how the set um, turns into, uh, how would you call it? Decomposition. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. So how does it turn into a vector? It's like, I mean, I, this, the way I'm seeing this is like you have some kind of total energy density at a, at a point in space. Is yeah, that correct. Much more, so, yeah, so, correct. So but how does that turn into acceleration? Is Because the, the, the acceleration at that point is already known. So all I've done is just decompose it. So I've taken a known value, which is G or any point in a gravitational field. So standard new... Newtonian mechanics, right, for acceleration. And I've just decomposed that value of acceleration. So that value of acceleration is equal to this number plus this number plus this plus this, you know, plus this plus this plus this, etc. You add them all up, right? And you end up with 9.81. So if, if the if the vacuum, if this is representing the amount of vacuum modes at each point, then the acceleration would be correspond to a derivative with respect to that value, wouldn't it? This is more like the just the energy density in, at each point. Yeah, correct. It is the energy uh, the the energy density at each point. You're absolutely right. So it's what I've done is okay. Basically, the approach that I've taken converts the mass energy density of the planet, right, and represents it as a spectral energy density in the quantum vacuum. That's it. Right, so, but the actual technique that I use is what I've described. It's a Fourier decomposition. So there's no actual transformation from one domain to another occurring. It's it's actually just a decomposition because people often make them that mistake. I refer to Fourier, and the very first thing they do is re, is reach for Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms, etc. No, 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 no. These are other things. These are these are domain transformations. I haven't transformed anything. I've just simply decomposed what Newtonian mechanics is already there. I've quantized Newtonian mechanics as per the definition, as per the English language definition, the textbook definition of what quantization is. And that's actually an important uh, discussion because I've encountered people whom I convinced the students because they simply do not have a grasp of what quantization is. And quantization can be many things. But at the end of the day, it all goes back to the English language definition of quantization. There are multiple ways that things can be quantized. And for some reason, for some reason, uh, physicists, particularly in, in my opinion, students are taught one way of quantization and they believe, well, that's the only way that you do it. Well, it's not. Quantization is an English language definition. Even music is quantized. I don't know whether you guys play play music, for example, but but if you play, uh, my father was a professional pianist his, in, his, his entire life. I mean, keyboards have a function called quantization. You, you press on this button and what it does is the amplitude of whatever waves that you are producing, it quantizes those amplitudes, right? And that also suits the electrical the uh, definition or electronic definition of quantization as well. So quantization is actually a very big word and there's more than just one way to skin a cat. So that's why I wanted to kind of emphasize quantization. What I've done is using Fourier, uh, Fourier series is quantize Newtonian acceleration. Yeah, so anyway, uh, back onto this. Can I just get you to, to scroll up just one, one, one doobies? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so now this is actually a really important, a really, 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 really super important um, slide here. One thing that uh, Bob Lazar has never mentioned, uh, perhaps he, he's never mentioned it because in his view it, it wasn't important. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because from his point of view, the, the, the magic of the whole S4 experience is all around uh, element 115. And he wouldn't be wrong in, in, in holding that position. But one thing that's never mentioned is the scale, the benchtop scale uh, of the experimental setup that he allegedly used at S4. Now, that, that benchtop uh, um, uh, setup 
that mock-up was actually built by a chap named uh, Barry Castillo, according to statements, uh, written statements by Emeritus Professor Paul Edwin Potter. Now, what's sig really significant about this is that um, that, that uh, uh, test bench mock-up must, must have been built to half scale. And that's really critical because if it wasn't, then then the numbers scientifically do not line up. If Bob worked on a uh, full full size scale on the test bench, then the science behind that doesn't line up with standard nuclear physics. The only way around that is that if Bob Castillo built a half scale model. Now it makes a lot of sense to me that he would build a half scale model, and I talk about this in the in the video. Because what that effectively does, by building a half-scale model, it effectively quadruples the element 115 uh, reserves uh, that the uh, US you know, Department of Defense actually has, right, in order to conduct experiments. So if they started off, I think Bob, uh, Bob mentioned... Um, I think they had 500 pounds. I think that's 267 kilo or something like this, right? This is, I'm going from memory here. So, so, so building rigs like this at half scale effectively, in essence, gives you four times that amount because you're only using a quarter of the material, right? But what's really important is that if the rig built by Barry Castillo was not at half scale, then there, there is actually a really big hole in the science, as reported uh, in the Bob Lazar story, it would in fact mean that the density of element uh, 115 would need to be twice as high as what has been uh, predicted by Burkhard Frick from the University of Kassel in Germany. And that translates to um, not element 115, but element 246. So that, that model must have been built half scale. So in the Project Gravitor documentary, if they show a full scale model, that is what was actually in the sports model that Lazar apparently worked on, if they show in their in their video in the, the laboratory the same scale, wrong, they've, they've made a mistake. Someone's made a mistake somewhere because the numbers just don't add up. They, they don't align with standard nuclear physics. So that's why that's, uh, uh, that, that frame is actually important. So here you can see uh, on the right-hand side, that's the, the, the model, the scale model that was built by Ken Wright. So Ken Wright uh, was a nuclear engineer with the US Navy. He had a meeting around 2000, something like this, uh, with, with Bob Lazar. Um, you know, you can, find, uh, you can find, I've got photographs of him there and you can find on Ken Wright's page. So uh, I assume, uh, Bob Lazar gave him the correct dimensions. So he built this scale model. If you look at that that reactor dome, it looks to me like a salad bowl, right? If you look at that, if you look at that reactor bowl, that salad bowl when it's in Ken Wright's hand, you can see, you can see that that is not 280 millimeters in diameter. You can just see it, right? Yet the diagram that, that you see there on the left hand side, that comes from Paul Edwin Potter. And very clearly, it is labelled as 280 millimetres in diameter. So when you halve that scale, everything works out. If you don't halve that scale, there's a big hole in the science behind the Lazar story. And I talk about that in, the, in, in, in my videos. So in that playlist, it starts off with the Project Gravitor synopsis. And then underneath that, the next one plays like the full episode, full 65, full 67, full 68, etc. Um, if people want to get uh, get into that, so if I can just yeah, just have a look there. If you look at the if you look at the playlist, the Project Gravitor playlist. If you just click on the play, like, yeah, that's it. So yeah, you can see uh, um, the 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 composition of of uh, of what's there. So I would I would recommend um, everybody to to try and find the time to do that. To, to have a look at that, but if you if you don't if you're time poor, you can just watch the first one, which is the uh, synopsis. If you want the meat and potatoes, you can you can go into the other stuff as well. And I've included the spreadsheet calculator there, so that people can do their own calculations based upon the the spreadsheet that, that I've put together.
So, Jeremy, if, if I can just get you to go back to that presentation for a moment. Okay, so if you can move on to the next slide. Okay, now this is something really important as well. Okay, this is something really important as well. Okay, now um, this is important because um, it explains something that um, I personally believe Bob Lazar, Bob Lazar was wrong about. Once again, I'm not saying he lied. I don't think the man lied at all, but I do think he's human and he's made mistakes. Now, Bob Lazar mentioned that uh, you might have seen in his video the goofy, so-called goofy behaviour of UFOs. Like, you know, they, they they tend to jitter around and stuff, right? Now, um, Bob uh, um, attributes that characteristics to the variations in the uh, gravitational acceleration field at the surface of the Earth, right? I disagree with that completely. What I'm saying, I, I, I believe that that behaviour occurs, but I believe it occurs because the manner in which the gravity A wave signal is shot towards towards the Earth incorporates digital uh, modulation. Now, that, that box there, that gravity as information box there that I've got there, that's actually, that's standard that's standard science, right? I actually, in episode 51, I actually referred to where I actually get that from. And that uh, uh, that diagram very clearly states that uh, that uh, that solution is very susceptible to interference. So the reason I believe um, um, we see or we see the reason for that for that goofy behaviour that Bob Lazar describes is due to um, electromagnetic interference from various sources, not from variations in the gravitational field of the, uh, at, at the surface of the Earth or, or anywhere else, because I've run the numbers and quite frankly, it doesn't vary enough to explain that behaviour. That behaviour, if it's if it's real, comes from um, 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 EM interference as per the digital modulation diagram there. That's my opinion anyway. So let's have a look if there's anything. I can't remember if there's anything after after that slide. No, that's the that's that's the end of it. So um, one thing that's important to if, if, Jeremy, if I can get yep, stop right there. No, just scroll up just a little bit. Okay. So what I want to emphasize is that Paul Edwin Potter. So that diagram at the bottom there is from Paul Edwin Potter. So I've just ripped that off. Okay. Now one point that he makes there, which I want to emphasize, is that. He uh, uh, states millimeter wavelengths pass through the hell, so pass through the hole. So millimeter gravity A wavelengths pass through the hole. Well, that's exactly microwave frequency range, and that's exactly uh, the range and the, the wavelength that I've calculated completely independently, right? Um, using my particle physics stuff. So what I'm what I'm getting to is that my particle physics stuff let's say by coincidence aligns precisely with uh, the work done by Paul Edwin Potter, right? I personally don't believe in coincidences, right? But, you know, some, some people do and sometimes they are valid. But I find it remarkable that uh, my particle physics analysis, Fourier analysis of an element 115 atom leads to exactly what... Uh, Emeritus Professor Paul Edwin Potter claims right there and also agrees with his diagram exactly with the uh, um, the reactor dome and wave guide assembly. It's just, it's it's all too coincidental for it to be truly coincidental, in my opinion. It just It lines up too well. So these are the kinds of details that, that I'll be looking for in the Project Gravitor um, documentary when it eventually... Uh, when it eventually comes out. Cool. So, um, uh, if that's if that presentation's finished up, I had one other yeah, question. Yeah, it. yep. it's done. Um, so, does this extra um, uh, does this like Fourier decomposition at each point? Yeah. Relate in any way to uh, the uh, Einstein? Not not Einstein Carton. Uh, Einstein Carton or Kaluza? Uh, there was a, I think it was Einstein Carton theory, but I'm just checking. Yeah, well, I can, I can tell you that. The Kaluza answer is no. 
Because Kaluza yeah. Klein theory is a fifth dimensional theory. I think it was Kaluza Klein theory, I guess. Yeah, no. Look, it's certainly um um so no no is the short answer, right? If it if it actually does, look, it might, right? I've never investigated it because it wasn't uh, it wasn't what I needed. What I wanted to do was solve a problem. And I should emphasize that that this Lazar stuff that I've worked out, it's just it, it's just a fluke. I mean, I had no intention of doing this. I mean, look, you, you and I, um, Michael, you've, you've given me, I've got to tell viewers, right? Michael's amazing. He's absolutely given me a complete grilling and done a really deep dive into, into all of this. And I've got to compliment you. I mean, you are, you have literally moved a mountain, right? Now, when Todd and I started this, it, it had no, it had nothing to do with Lazar at all. Nothing. Um, the intention, uh, uh, the intention, at least for me, in, in developing this, this methodology was to determine the size of the proton, uh, neutron, and other fundamental particles. And I was, I was shocked beyond belief when I ended up with um, um, a result, when, when I ended up with uh, one equation that described both the root mean squared charge radius of the proton and the mean squared charge radius of the neutron exactly experimentally verified. I was shocked. That that right there convinced me, and I knew straight away that that uh, the approach that Todd and I had taken about making the energy content of the quantum vacuum equal to the mass energy content of matter, that equilibrium, was just gold. It worked, right? It worked. So it really does demonstrate that nature, that that all particles really are in equilibrium with the space-time manifold surrounding them. And this is something that that general relativity fails to, to consider or comprehend. That is, uh, as far as general relativity is concerned, if you take a, um, um, a manifold in Kowski space flat and you plop a, um, a proton into it, that proton bends space-time permanently. Right? As long as, as, long as nothing changes... That curvature is permanent, whereas the work that Todd and I have done show that that curvature is not permanent. It is that curvature is an energy sink which is being fed by an energy source, and the energy source is the proton that I just talked about, and that proton is losing energy to its environment, and that's what's causing the curvature. Eventually, eventually, that proton or that fundamental particle, whatever it is, is going to evaporate, and eventually that will all enter the quantum vacuum uh, that will all enter what what I call the dark reservoir of quantum potential energy, right, eventually. So I, I mentioned I mentioned Kaluza Klein and Einstein yeah. Carton theories. I, I think Einstein Carton is fifth dimensional, but basically both of these models are quite nice in some ways, but they add an extra random dimension and people are like, why is there this extra dimension? And I, it, it looks like it, may co it might correspond to this uh, Fourier series decomposition. Yeah, it does. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So so I would agree, right? Uh, look, I'm not talking about agreeing with Kaluza Klein, right? Because that's that's a, it's a it's too big to discuss here, right? And I, and quite frankly, I don't know it deeply enough. But uh, I absolutely agree that we do not we do not have we do not live in a three spatial dimension universe. We live in a four spatial dimension universe. So if you include time. You've got five dimensions, right? But forgetting time for a moment, I actually insist that we are living in a four spatial dimension universe. And that fourth spatial dimension, right, is what I call the dark reservoir of quantum potential energy. So when a wave, ask yourself this, when a wave function collapses for whatever reason, where does the energy go? Well, I mean... For an electron, the energy would still be the same. It's just dispersed. No, 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 no. It's got to go somewhere. Or, or in other words, turn it on its head. Where does the energy come from for the Casimir effect? Right. What's okay. That's the energy source. Oh, and that's another thing I wanted to ask about. So your, your model would predict that the Casimir effect would vary in different places in like the solar Yeah, correct. Yeah, absolutely. So Absolutely. that would be that'd be a good way to prove it. Just launch a small CubeSat, and it should be different in space a little bit, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. But the problem is, 
the problem with that is that the Casimir effect, it's extremely difficult to accurately measure even on Earth. So, mm. so in space, so what you, so what I believe is going to happen is this, right? Eventually, uh, we will develop uh, technology um, at the at the nano scale, which is going to go into space, right? On say CubeSats or whatever, and it's going to get there, and it's going to half work, and that is when we'll understand that the Casimir force is different up there than it is here. Well, that's one thing is like uh, in in some sorts of in some proteins and actually in some in some biological processes, there's already stuff that's affected by the Casimir forces. So I would imagine that some biological processes could be affected based on the environment. OK, I didn't I, I wasn't aware of that. So that's something new for me. So, look, it's it's what I've uh, it's what I predicted in 2011. I wrote a um, 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 an article on that presented at a, at a conference in, in San Diego. It's called the Extraterrestrial Casimir Effect. Um, and in that, I, I show very clearly um, what the percentage increase or reduction will be in various gravitational environments. So it, it would be find... interesting. Sorry, if I, sorry for interrupting. It would be very interesting if, if we start building spinning habitats in space and then we find that people still are unhealthy in those spinning habitats because yeah. we, we assume that it's just the um the downward force on our muscles and bones that's that's changing our physiology but what if like there's additional effects just by the ambient vacuum environment yeah correct a absolutely Look, i i agree with you and until you mentioned it michael i had no idea that that there were biological processes that could be affected by the casimir effect i mean um, even just even just like geckos like they use the casimir effect to stick to walls in the first place yeah right so um have you found it yet jeremy not yet so if i wonder i wonder if geckos wouldn't work on the moon it would might not not have i know there's less gravity too so maybe yeah so if you if you can if you can pull up that paper look in fact let me uh i'm gonna see if i can find it myself actually hang on because i want to i can actually tell you what the numbers are yeah i saw them in there somewhere um yeah, yeah. This is the paper this is the right one yeah that's it that's the right one yeah so if you if you scroll down um you'll actually say uh, stop 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 uh, go, go go back up so i don't know whether people can see that or not but in that first uh in that first table um, you'll see that my expect my prediction is that on the surface of the moon, the Casimir effect will be 37% higher than what we uh, measure uh, at the sur surface of the Earth. It'll be 12% higher um, on the on the surface of Mars. It'll be the same basically uh, on the surface of Venus, and in low Earth low Earth orbit, it'll be about 5% lower than the surface of the Earth, and by high Earth orbit. Um, it'll it'll be about ninety five percent lower. So with respect to the to the to the cubesats and the the biological factors that you that you talked about. Um, so the answer to that question, my expectation is about a five percent reduction um, in the Casimir force at low Earth orbit is my prediction. So it, it, look, it'll be interesting to see if it's real. You know? Yeah, that that might not bode well for like longer term space flight we'll have to see well yeah that's right so but as i say i i didn't i didn't know about uh about the um the biological stuff so well hopefully hopefully it's small effects yeah look I, i'd certainly be intensely curious uh to see whether you know satellites kind of half work which is what i'm saying because nothing's ever going to completely fail right you know things aren't designed to completely fail but they can certainly half work and i'd, I'd be I'd be curious to see if it actually happens. Yeah. Now, this this paper here actually forms the backbone of my uh, uh, Law of Robert Lazar um, article. So basically, I've taken big chunks out of this and I've put it into uh, the Lazar article. And I've done that so that people have um, everything they need to decompose, to, to fully understand and derive for themselves my claims that 7.46 hertz claim i could have made the 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 lazar article a lot shorter just by pointing to this but i know what people are like right unless you put 
you know, unless you put something under their nose, they, you know, they they won't look. So, yeah, I've taken big chunks out of here. Yeah. Cool stuff. Thanks for sharing all this, Rick, and we'll see how the we'll see how the movie turns out or the documentary turns out. Well, yeah. Look, I'm I'm intensely uh, curious myself to to see how it comes out because I want to compare what I've done with uh, with what they produce. Now, apparently, according to uh, Luigi, the the director slash producer guy there, um, apparently, according to what they you know they say on on um, on his videos, that uh, Bob himself has been impressed by how accurately it's all being reproduced. So. I'm intensely curious to see, um, you know, what what the physical dimensions of things are and uh, how well they align to what the theory says. Um, and I felt it important to to talk about this before the movie actually gets gets released, so that we can determine how, you know, how, how likely um, the uh, the solution presented by the Gravitor team is to. You know, at, well, not how likely, but how it compares to to the to the science. Um, so, uh, as as you guys are very well aware, I absolutely believe that uh, everybody needs to focus on the science behind the Lazar story, not the the credibility of the man. I don't care, right? It doesn't matter if he's a toilet cleaner, right? What I'm interested in is what's testable, you know, scientifically testable. And, in what he says so amen to that yeah that's it so uh yeah so look that's 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 it for me did you do you guys have any any more questions uh i snuck in all the ones i wanted to ask at least yeah i know look i gotta, I, I gotta I tell to ask a quick question of michael yeah. because it, we, we had talked about this uh wedge of this element 115 stuff yeah and i had commented you know that there's no stable isotope it's unlikely that there would be a stable isotope but, but michael um pointed out that there are nuclear uh, iso isomers and ways of you could shoot gamma rays basically out a piece of this and keep it stable yeah, yeah no that's not quite how it works jeremy it's the gamma ray stabilizes it then you can stop shooting gamma rays at it it's not like a continuous field you have to put it in um, oh, okay it's um, yeah. So like tantalum 180 is unstable in nature, but there's tantalum 180-M, which instead of an isotope, it's an isomer, and that what that means is that the nucleus has been it has absorbed a gamma ray, and instead of fissioning or something, it actually becomes more stable. And so there's a few isotopes that this happens for, and typically they have very high nuclear spins, so that the the additional torque on the on the nucleus ends up stabilizing it somehow um, right look that's actually a, a, a really good um we should try and expand this a little bit um i'll, I'll just uh, tell sort of the viewers what you and i've been talking about you know the questions with, that you've been asking and, and okay. how, that, how it might tie in so it's my personal opinion so based upon the analysis that i've done right which i think you would agree at the very least it's expansive i've done a lot of work right Okay. Now, what I believe happens in normal matter is I believe that um, in the case of a charged particle, proton or electron, etc., uh, that the uh, the uh, there's a 90 degree phase difference between the electrostatic force and the gravitational force. Right? That's what I believe happens. In, oh yeah, in, I was very curious about that. What what does uh what does that mean in in terms of physical intuition or? Okay, yeah. okay, good. So so this is this is what I sort of want to get into. So so I believe I I've concluded. In fact, I believe I've, in my opinion, conclusively mathematically demonstrated that there is a ninety degree phase difference between the uh, um the uh, quantum vacuum quantum vacuum spectrum associated with electric charge and the quantum vacuum spectrum associated with mass. So those two spectra are out of phase by 90 degrees and they never interact for normal matter. However, I'm proposing that in the case of element 115, if the so-called anti-gravitational properties claimed by Bob Lazar are real, 
then that phase shift is no longer 90 degrees. It's either zero degrees or 180 degrees. Now, if it is zero or 180 degrees, how does that eventuate? Well, I propose that it happens through the specific geometry of an element 115 nucleus in whatever the, the stable form might be, whether it's the 296 isotope or the 299 isotope. Now, um, it would theoretically be possible to, to model that, that outcome, that behaviour, if you had a supercomputer and quantum chromodynamics, et cetera, so on and so forth. Obviously, I don't have access to this kind of stuff. So it's to me, it's it's an intuitive guesstimate. But that's what I believe is happening. Now, with respect to what you're talking about and isomers, maybe, maybe those two things are linked. What so did, maybe... What, what did they say that the density was again for element one? Okay. Yeah, so, so Burkhardt Frick... Um, estimates uh, the density to be 13.5 grams per centimetre cubed, roughly the same as mercury. I'm claiming it's around 13.8, 13.77, 13.8 is what I'm claiming. Um, so it's just a little bit heavier. This is interesting to me because the density of tantalum is, 100, is about 15 grams per centimetre. So it's close. It's a little bit okay. higher, but it's close. And yeah. tantalum happens to match a lot of the physical characters, except like they call, they said it was like orangish or copperish color. So yeah, wrong. But it, I mean, a lot of the other characteristics it would seem to match, and it makes me wonder if the other nuclear isomer, the other stabilized nuclear isomers, might have a, a phase shift in this similar way, also. Look, that's a good question. So what I was sort of getting at before was that maybe my my intuition is half right. And perhaps the rest of the way are the isomers that that that, that you're talking about, because because I can't know for certain, right? I mean, well, it's definitely tantalum is close, so it yeah. could if it, if the density is supposed to be thirteen point eight or thirteen point five or something like that, and tantalum is yeah. fifteen, then you can imagine maybe like a tantalum copper alloy that's the color that they described. Could be. It's interesting. Could be. Tonight. So look, you, you've you've posed some 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 good questions there. My uh, my my view is to take the story um, by Bob Lazar as stated by Bob Lazar, um, because otherwise, if you don't, if you don't use, if you don't set some kind of baseline, you can go off in all kinds of directions. So, you know, I was I was interested in in in, in ways of testing scientifically his story, and that's what I've come up with. Very cool. Good work, Ricardo. Thanks. And I just want to stress again to, to viewers, uh, Michael, you really you really did a deep dive, and I've, 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 got to, I've got to thank you for that. You really you gave me a real grilling. People don't know. People don't know the, the, the questions, the way you hammered me and I had to reply, and you really grilled me. So yeah, people don't know that. Happy to help. Yeah. Well, I took that. a lot of time away from work here, so I hope, I hope you appreciate it. Yeah, oh, I do. Absolutely, I do. Very, very much. And that's why, that's why I bring it up. All right. Well, this is uh, great. I'm going to make sure I put um, your research gate papers and all that in the links yeah. in the description so people can check out your work there. Um, yeah, also, man. your work on the the, uh, the Project Gravatar playlist uh, in yep. Quinty Essential Part 5, which is your YouTube channel. Yeah, great. And uh, let's do a, uh, a comparison. Once the the uh, documentaries come out. We'll have a look at it and we'll do a comparison and see how things line up. Awesome. Sure. That sounds great. Sounds All good. right. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate your time. And uh, I'm sure I'll be talking to you uh, again soon. All right. You're out. Excellent. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks, thank fellas. you. Yeah. Cheers. Bye-bye.